tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hello, boils and ghouls. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you all for your donations to our fundraiser. We've made some great progress, and it's all thanks to you. We still have a little bit to go, so if you're able, please head to www.helpchilling.org to contribute. By doing so, you're helping us continue to make the world a bit spookier. Now, on to the show. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, listeners, and welcome to Horror Hill. I'm your host and narrator, Eric Peabody, and tonight begins a two-parter featuring a story by the godfather of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights himself, Craig Groshek. Craig has taken a moment to swap his admin hat to his author hat, and I personally think it's resulted in a damn good yarn. The story is titled Ethan Hell. Our protagonist, Ethan Hall, is a man that's trying to do his best. He's a medical nurse and takes his job in the emergency room very seriously. He cares deeply for his fiance and his dog, and all he wants is to help people. Unfortunately, these stressors in Ethan's life have been building, slowly but consistently, and we meet him right as he's about to lose control. Ethan's unexpected outburst is violent enough in its own right, but it also serves as the first in a series of events that will change his life forever. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our... Uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author Craig Groshek, I give you Ethan Hell, Part 1. Chapter 1 Ethan Hull's eyes scanned the crowded emergency room of Forest View Medical Center, his mind already in overdrive despite the shift having only just begun. The ER was packed, as usual, with the unmistakable chaos of Monday morning. Nurses and doctors darted between curtained-off bays, responding to the urgent needs of patients, their faces set in the stoic expressions of those accustomed to the worst. 
Ethan's hands moved on autopilot, methodically preparing a syringe for a patient writhing on a nearby gurney. He glanced down at his patient, a young man in his early twenties, drenched in sweat and shaking uncontrollably. Another overdose, Ethan thought, trying to push away the frustration that gnawed at his already frayed nerves. This wasn't what he had envisioned when he decided to become a nurse, but then again, nothing about his life had gone quite as planned. Ethan, we've got another one coming in. Possible GSW, ETA two minutes. A voice crackled through the overhead speaker. The charge nurse, Shelly, never missed a beat, her voice as calm as ever. Ethan nodded to himself, finishing the injection and stepping back to observe his patient. The young man's tremors began to subside, his breathing evening out as the medication took hold. For a moment, Ethan allowed himself to breathe. He could feel the familiar tightness in his chest beginning to ease, only to be replaced by the creeping dread of what was yet to come. Another gunshot wound. Another life on the line. Another chance for everything to go wrong. He moved quickly, discarding his gloves and stepping out of the room. As he did, his mind wandered back to Emily, his fiance, and the scene he had left behind that morning. Their small apartment had been in disarray, the remnants of Emily's latest bender scattered across the living room. Empty wine bottles, cigarette butts in the ashtray, an all-too-common sight these days. Sherman, their golden retriever, had followed him to the door, his soulful eyes filled with the silent plea for normalcy that Ethan couldn't provide. The relationship had been different once. He remembered when Emily had been vibrant, full of life and laughter. They'd met in college, both pursuing careers in healthcare, Ethan in nursing, Emily in radiology. They had clicked immediately, their shared passion for helping others binding them together. But over time, the stress of their jobs, combined with Emily's growing dependency on alcohol, had eroded the foundation of their relationship. Now, ten years later, They were little more than strangers sharing the same space. A sudden crash snapped Ethan out of his reverie, pulling him back to the present. A patient down the hall had knocked over a tray of instruments, sending scalpels and syringes skittering across the floor. Ethan rushed over to help, his movements mechanical, his thoughts a world away. As he stooped to pick up the fallen items, a sharp pain shot through his lower back. He winced, but forced himself to keep moving. Pain was something he had grown accustomed to, both physical and mental. His body bore the marks of his profession, bruises from patients' fists, scratches from clawing hands, and the dull ache in his back from years of bending over gurneys. His mind, too, carried its own scars, invisible but no less painful. The stress of the job weighed heavily on him, driving him to seek refuge in the few outlets he had left. The handful of hobbies he attempted during his rare moments of free time, and the painkillers and kratom that had become his crutch. Ethan rose slowly, pocketing the last of the scattered instruments, and made his way to the nurse's station. The chaos around him felt distant, like a movie playing out in the background. He glanced up at the clock on the wall, its hands crawling toward the noon hour. Only a few more hours to go. Ethan, you okay? Shelley's voice cut through the fog in his mind. She was standing across from him, her brow furrowed in concern. Yeah, just tired, he replied, forcing a smile. It's been a rough morning. Shelley nodded, her expression softening. Tell me about it. But hey, you've got your shift ending soon, right? Hang in there. Ethan nodded, grateful for the small bit of encouragement. Shelley had always been a rock for the team, her calm demeanor and unwavering support a beacon in the storm of the ER. But even she couldn't see how deep the darkness within him had grown, how close he was to the edge. The doors to the ER swung open, and the paramedics rushed in with the gunshot victim. Ethan pushed aside his thoughts, his professional mask slipping into place as he moved to assist. The world narrowed to the patient in front of him, the rhythmic beeping of the monitors, the blood soaking through gauze and bandages. But even as he worked, a small voice in the back of his mind whispered of the inevitable. 
This was his life now, a cycle of violence, pain, and temporary relief. And as the chaos of the ER raged on, he knew, deep down, that something had to give. Chapter 2 The clatter of metal and the rapid beeping of monitors filled the ER as Ethan fought to keep the patient on the gurney alive. Blood spurted from the young man's abdomen, staining Ethan's gloves a deep crimson. The gunshot wound had torn through flesh and muscle, leaving a gaping hole that refused to stop bleeding despite the pressure he applied. "'Where's that damn surgeon?' Ethan muttered under his breath, his heart pounding in his chest. The patient's pulse was weak, thready, a clear sign that time was running out. Shelley stood by his side, holding a tray of instruments, her face set in a mask of concentration. "'They're on their way,' she replied, her voice steady. "'Just keep him stable.' Ethan gritted his teeth, focusing on the task at hand. The blood was warm and slick under his fingers, and he could feel the life slipping away from the man beneath him. The world around him seemed to fade into a blur, the voices of the other nurses and doctors merging into a distant hum. All that mattered was keeping this one life tethered to the earth for just a little longer. But the man's body had other plans. Ethan felt the pulse beneath his fingers flutter, then fade completely. He moved quickly, starting chest compressions, his mind repeating the rhythm, 30 compressions, 2 breaths. He worked methodically, his movements automatic, but in his gut, he knew it was futile. The patient was slipping away, and there was nothing more he could do. The surgeon burst into the room, but it was too late. The man's heart had stopped and despite their best efforts, it refused to start again. After what felt like an eternity, the surgeon shook his head, signaling for Ethan to stop. Ethan stepped back, his hand shaking, his breath coming in short gasps. The adrenaline that had kept him going drained away, leaving him hollow. He felt the weight of another lost life settle on his shoulders, a familiar, crushing burden. Call it... The surgeon said quietly, and the words cut through Ethan like a knife. Time of death, 12.47 p.m., Ethan heard himself say, his voice sounding distant, hollow. He pulled off his blood-soaked gloves, tossing them into the bin with more force than necessary. You did all you could, Ethan, Shelley said, placing a hand on his shoulder. But her words offered no comfort. He had heard them too many times before, and they had lost their meaning. Ethan nodded absently, but his mind was elsewhere. He turned on his heel and walked out of the trauma bay, his thoughts a whirlwind of frustration and exhaustion. He needed a moment to breathe, to escape the suffocating confines of the ER. He made his way to the break room, his movement stiff and jerky. The room was empty, save for a half-empty pot of coffee and a few scattered chairs. Ethan slumped into one, burying his face in his hands. The room was quiet, a stark contrast to the chaos just beyond the door, but the silence did little to soothe him. Instead, it amplified the noise in his head, the constant, relentless clatter of his thoughts. He could feel the red zone creeping up on him, the mental space he slipped into when the stress became too much to bear. It was a place where everything felt distant and unreal, like he was watching his life unfold from outside his body. In the red zone, his emotions dulled, his sense of self slipping away. It was a coping mechanism, one that had served him well in the past, but now it felt like a trap, a prison he couldn't escape. His hand trembled as he reached into his pocket, pulling out a small bottle of pills, painkillers, They were the only thing that seemed to help anymore, dulling the edges of his pain, both physical and emotional. He popped a couple into his mouth, swallowing them dry. The bitterness coated his tongue, but he didn't care. He just needed the pain to stop. Ethan leaned back in the chair, closing his eyes and willing the pills to take effect. He imagined himself somewhere else, anywhere but here. 
The door to the break room swung open, and Ethan's eyelids snapped up. One of his colleagues, a nurse named Mark, entered, looking as exhausted as Ethan felt. "'Hey, you okay?' Mark asked, grabbing a cup of coffee and slumping into a chair across from Ethan. "'Yeah, just tired.' Ethan replied, forcing a smile that didn't reach his eyes. Mark nodded, taking a sip of his coffee. I hear ya, that last one was rough. Ethan didn't respond. His mind was already drifting back to Emily, wondering how she was holding up. He had left her at home that morning, still passed out on the couch, an empty wine bottle clutched in her hand. He knew she was struggling, but he didn't know how to help her. He didn't even know how to help himself. I should get back, Ethan said suddenly, pushing himself to his feet. He needed to keep moving, to stay busy. If he stopped, he was afraid he might never start again. Take it easy, man, Mark called after him, but Ethan barely heard him. He was already halfway out the door, his mind focused on the next task, the next patient, anything to keep the seemingly inevitable crash at bay. But the red zone wasn't done with him yet. The rest of the shift passed in a blur, one patient after another, each more demanding than the last. Ethan worked on autopilot, his hands moving with practiced precision, his mind detached from the chaos around him. He knew he was nearing his breaking point, but he couldn't afford to think about that now. Not when there were still patients to treat, lives to save. It was late afternoon when the incident happened. Ethan was in one of the smaller examination rooms, tending to a patient who had come in with what appeared to be a simple stomach ache. The man was fidgety, his eyes darting around the room as if looking for an escape. Just relax, Ethan said, pressing on the man's abdomen, checking for signs of tenderness. We'll get you fixed up in no time. The man didn't respond, his eyes wide and wild. Ethan felt a prickling at the back of his neck, a sense of unease he couldn't quite shake. He glanced up at the monitor, checking the man's vitals. Everything seemed normal. Heart rate a little elevated, but nothing to be concerned about. Do you have any pain here? Ethan asked, pressing on the man's side. The man flinched, then suddenly rocketed forward, his hand shooting out toward Ethan's throat. Ethan reacted instinctively, grabbing the man's wrist and twisting it away. But the man was stronger than he looked, and before Ethan could fully process what was happening, he felt a sharp pain in his side. He looked down, his breath catching in his throat as he saw the glint of metal. A knife, a small switchblade, had been hidden in the man's hand. Blood was already seeping through Ethan's scrubs, warm and sticky against his skin. The weight of all of his anxiety and the combined pressure of the evening slammed into him like a freight train. Time seemed to slow, the edges of his vision darkening as his world narrowed to the man in front of him. The man was shouting something, but Ethan couldn't hear the words. All he could hear was the pounding of his own heart, the rush of blood in his ears. Without thinking, Ethan lashed out, his fist connecting with the man's jaw. The man stumbled back, the knife clattering to the floor, but Ethan didn't stop. He couldn't stop. All rational thought was gone, replaced by a primal, animalistic rage. He lunged at the man, his hands wrapping around his throat. He squeezed, his fingers digging into the man's flesh, feeling the life drain out of him. The man struggled, his eyes bulging, his mouth opening in a silent scream. But Ethan didn't let go. He couldn't. The red zone demanded blood, and he was powerless to resist. It wasn't until the man's body went limp that Ethan finally released his grip, stumbling back as if coming out of a trance. He looked down at his hands, covered in blood, and then at the man on the floor his neck twisted at an unnatural angle. The reality of what he had done hit him all at once, and Ethan crumpled to the floor, his back against the wall. His breath came in short, panicked gasps, his vision swimming as he tried to make sense of the scene in front of him. 
The door to the examination room burst open, and Shelley rushed in, followed by two security guards. They froze at the sight of Ethan, his hands stained red. The man's lifeless body sprawled upon the floor. What? What happened? Shelley whispered, her face pale. Ethan couldn't answer. He couldn't even form a coherent thought. All he could do was sit there, rocking back and forth, mumbling to himself, his mind shattered. The last thing he remembered before everything went black was the sound of sirens in the distance, growing louder and louder until they drowned out everything else. Chapter 3 Ethan awoke to the cold, hard surface of a jail cell floor, his body aching from the recent surgery that had saved his life. He groaned, pushing himself up slowly, feeling the pull of fresh sutures along his side. The wound throbbed with each movement, a sharp reminder of how close he had come to death. Ethan glanced down at himself and realized he was no longer in his work-issued scrubs, but in unfamiliar street clothes, hastily pulled on over his bandages. The hospital was a distant memory now. He had been patched up and then dumped into this bleak, dismal cell, left to rot while the world decided his fate. The cell was confining, its walls a dull, oppressive gray. A narrow cot and a grimy toilet were the only furnishings, and a small barred window high above offered the only natural light. Ethan felt the weight of the place pressing down on him, the air thick with the scent of antiseptic, sweat, and despair. He shivered, partly from the cold, but mostly from the memory of what had landed him here, the man he had killed, the uncontrollable rage that had overtaken him, the knife, the blood, and the sheer brutality of it all. It had been self-defense, hadn't it? The man had attacked him, slashed him with a concealed blade. Ethan had only reacted, hadn't he? But Ethan knew the truth. He had lost control. The man's face as Ethan strangled the life out of him, the feeling of his hands around that throat, squeezing until nothing remained. It was too much to bear. The man had been armed, yes, but Ethan's retaliation had been savage, far beyond what was necessary to protect himself. The footage, no doubt captured by the hospital's security cameras, would show that clearly. And now, here he was, the consequences of his actions crashing down on him like a tidal wave. The door to his cell clanked open and a guard stepped in. The man's face was hard, indifferent, as he placed a tray of food on the floor and left without a word, the door slamming shut behind him. Ethan didn't touch the tray. His stomach churned at the thought of eating. Instead, he leaned back against the wall, closing his eyes and trying to block out the reality of his situation. But it was no use. He couldn't stop replaying the events in his mind, over and over again. He had tried to defend himself, but the sheer ferocity of his response, that was something else entirely. He hadn't just defended himself. He had annihilated the man in front of him. And now, he was going to pay for it. It was in the dead of night, with the darkness in his cell so complete that he could barely see his own hand in front of his face, that he felt it. A presence. Something cold, malevolent, and old, indescribably ancient, pressing in on him from all sides. He shuddered, his heart hammering in his chest as he strained to see through the darkness. Then, as if summoned by his fear, a figure appeared at the far end of the cell. Ethan's breath caught in his throat. The man, or whatever it was, stood tall and imposing, dressed in a long, dark coat that reached the floor, with a wide-brimmed hat perched atop his head. But it was what obscured its face that sent a tremor through Ethan's bones. A plague doctor's mask, with its long, curved beak and empty, soulless eyes. The figure took a step forward. The shadows seemed to ripple around the figure as he moved closer, 
the air growing increasingly frigid with each passing second. Mr. Hall, the figure said, his voice smooth and unsettlingly calm. I believe we have some matters to discuss. Ethan pressed back against the wall, his body trembling uncontrollably. Who... who are you? He stammered, barely able to form the words. The figure tilted his head slightly, as if considering the question. You may call me Dr. Atticus Hargrove, he replied, the name rolling off his tongue with a dark elegance. I'm here to offer you a way out of your current predicament. Ethan blinked, trying to make sense of what was happening. A way out? What do you mean? Dr. Hargrove moved closer, his glassy, inhuman eyes fixed on Ethan. You're facing grave consequences for your actions, Mr. Hall. Murder, they're calling it. The evidence against you is overwhelming, I must say, and I'm afraid there is little hope for your freedom. But I can offer you something different, a chance to escape this fate and become more than you ever imagined. Ethan shook his head, his voice breaking as he spoke. It it was self-defense. The guy attacked me. He had a knife. I didn't mean to... It wasn't murder. Dr. Hargrove chuckled softly, the sound echoing unnervingly in the small cell. Ah, self-defense. That would be a fine argument were it not for the brutality of your response. The footage, Mr. Hull, shows a man far beyond the bounds of reason or restraint. The sheer savagery of your actions, the disproportionate force, you didn't just defend yourself. You obliterated him. Ethan's heart sank. He knew it was true, but hearing it put so bluntly made it all the more real. But it was still self-defense, he whispered, grasping at straws. Dr. Hargrove's voice turned cold, like a winter wind slicing through the soul. No one will buy that, Mr. Hall. Not when they see what's been captured on camera. Not when they hear the testimony. And certainly not when they learn that the man you killed was the cousin of a very powerful local businessman. A man with influence who will see to it that you pay dearly for what you've done, regardless of the circumstances. Ethan's blood ran cold. He hadn't known. How could he have known? But it didn't matter now. If what Dr. Hargrove was saying was true, then his fate was sealed. No jury would ever see it as self-defense, not with the evidence stacked against him, not with someone powerful pulling the strings. What do you want from me? Ethan asked, his voice all but betraying his rapidly fading resolve. Dr. Hargrove's masked face remained unreadable, but Ethan could sense a smile behind it. What I demand is your servitude, he replied smoothly. You will carry out tasks on my behalf, and in return, I will grant you the means to not just survive... But to thrive, you'll be free from this place, unbound by the laws that govern ordinary men. The words hung in the air, simultaneously tempting and terrifying. Ethan wanted to scream, to run, to do anything but agree to this monstrous proposition. But the alternative, the reality of rotting in this cell, burdened by his guilt, resigned to a life of misery was even more unbearable. And if I refuse? Ethan forced himself to ask, though he already knew the answer. Dr. Hargrove's tone was blunt, the edges of his words sharp and unforgiving. Then you will remain here, a forgotten man, condemned by your own hand. Your life will end in obscurity and regret. Ethan closed his eyes. He knew he was standing on the precipice of an abyss, and that one step in either direction would change his life forever. But he also knew, instinctively, 
that he was too weak, too desperate to resist the offer of salvation, no matter how dark the source. Yes, Ethan whispered, his voice breaking. I'll do it. I'll make the deal. Dr. Hargrove nodded, satisfaction evident in his posture. Then our contract is sealed. Await my instructions, Mr. Hall. You'll find that I'm a man of my word. As soon as the words left his mouth, the room seemed to shift. The air grew thicker, the shadows darker. Ethan blinked, and in the span of a heartbeat, Dr. Hargrove was gone. He was alone, left to grapple with the gravity of what he had just agreed to. Hours later, the guards made their rounds, seemingly oblivious to the supernatural encounter that had taken place. As they glanced in through the bars, Ethan couldn't help but stare at the security camera mounted in the corner of the room. One of the guards noticed his gaze and shrugged. Yeah, the cameras were on the fritz earlier, the guard remarked. Strange, when we checked the footage, it looked like you were talking to yourself. Ethan's blood ran cold, but he said nothing. His mind was spinning. The pain in his side was a dull yet ever-present throb, a constant reminder of the fragility of his life and the bargain he had made to preserve it. As Ethan lay back on the cot, the hours crept by in agonizing silence, his heart pounding as he waited for the inevitable. And then, as midnight approached, the air in the cell grew thick and stifling once more. The temperature plummeted, his breath turning to fog before his eyes. It was time. Chapter 4 Dr. Atticus Hargrove appeared in the corner of the cell, his dark presence filling the room. Ethan felt the now familiar chill that accompanied the plague doctor's appearance, but this time it was laced with a sense of impending doom. He knew that whatever was coming next would change him forever, physically, mentally, perhaps even spiritually. Hello again, Mr. Hall, Dr. Hargrove said his voice cutting through the night like a blade. Ethan sat up on the cot, his hands trembling slightly as he braced himself for what was to come. He had made his choice, sealing his fate with that simple word, yes. And now, there was no turning back. The air in the cell seemed to hum with an unnatural energy as Dr. Hargrove reached into his long, dark coat and produced a small vial filled with a dark, swirling liquid. The substance inside seemed to pulse with its own life, shifting colors as it caught the dim light. This will grant you the power you need to carry out my tasks, Dr. Hargrove explained, extending the vial toward Ethan. Drink it, and you will be transformed. But remember, you are bound to me now and there is no turning back. Ethan stared at the vial. His mind screamed at him to stop, to throw it away, to resist this dark path he had set himself on. But the pull of desperation, the fear of what awaited him without this pact, was irresistible. With a deep, shuddering breath, Ethan took the container from Hargrove's hand, the glass cool and smooth against his fingers. He hesitated for only a moment longer, then uncorked the vial and downed the contents in one gulp. The liquid burned as it slid down his throat, a sensation unlike anything he had ever experienced. It was as if he had swallowed fire, the heat spreading through his body in a searing wave. Ethan gasped, clutching at his chest as the pain intensified, every nerve in his body screaming in agony. He doubled over, falling off the cot and onto the cold concrete floor, writhing in pain as the mutation took hold. Dr. Hargrove stood over him, unflinching, observing the process in silence. Ethan's vision blurred, his body convulsing as the elixir worked its way through his system. His muscles tightened, his skin stretched taut over his bones, and for a moment he thought he might be torn apart from the inside out. Then, as suddenly as the pain had started, it began to subside, 
leaving behind an almost euphoric numbness. He lay on the floor, panting, as a strange sensation of power washed over him. It was subtle at first, a tingling in his fingertips, a heightened awareness of the world around him. But it quickly grew, the power surging through his veins like a drug, intoxicating and terrifying in equal measure. Ethan pushed himself up onto his hands and knees, feeling the strength coursing through his muscles. He was stronger, so much stronger than he had ever been. The pain in his side from the stab wound had vanished, and he could feel his heart beating steadily, thrumming with a newfound vigor as if indestructible. He slowly rose to his feet, his body racked by the aftershocks of the transformation. His surroundings seemed sharper, more vivid, every detail standing out in stark relief. He could hear the distant footsteps of the guards, the faint hum of the electricity running through the building's wires, even the soft breathing of another inmate in a neighboring cell. Hargrove watched him closely, his head tilted slightly to the side as if appraising his handiwork. You feel it, don't you? The plague doctor said, his voice smooth and confident. The power, the strength. This is just the beginning, Mr. Hall. You are now capable of things far beyond your wildest imagination. Ethan nodded, though the reality of what he had just experienced was only beginning to sink in. He could feel the power within him a dark, pulsating force that responded to his every thought and desire. But it was more than just physical strength. There was something else, something more profound. He could sense the presence of others around him, the faint echoes of their emotions and thoughts brushing against the edges of his consciousness. "'What have you done to me?' Ethan asked, his voice hoarse, a mix of awe and fear." I have given you the tools you require, Dr. Hargrove replied. Your body is now stronger, faster, more resilient than that of any ordinary human. You will heal quickly, endure pain that would break most men, and travel with a speed and agility that will appear supernatural to those around you. But that is not all. Ethan's eyes widened as he listened, the implications of the doctor's words sinking in. There's more? Dr. Hargrove nodded. Indeed. You will find that your mind has been enhanced as well. You will perceive the world in ways you never could before, see things others cannot see, and most importantly, you will be able to recognize those who are damned the ones destined for hell. You will know them on sight, feel the weight of their sins pressing against them. Ethan shuddered at the thought. And what... what am I supposed to do with this power? Dr. Hargrove's voice took on a sinister tone, the mask's eyes seeming to bore into the very fabric of Ethan's spirit. You will carry out my will, Mr. Hall. You will be my instrument, my enforcer. Those who are marked for damnation must be dealt with, and you will be the one to do it. You will round them up, dispatch them as necessary, and deliver their souls to me. The enormity of Ethan's actions crashed down on him, a wave of despair overwhelming his senses as the repercussions became crystal clear. He had sold his soul to the devil and become a monster in exchange for his life. And now he was bound to do unspeakable things in the name of that bargain. But these people, are they really damned? Ethan asked, his voice trembling with fear and guilt. How do I know they deserve this? Dr. Hargrove's response was final, devoid of emotion. You will know, Mr. Hall. The power I have given you will guide you. You will feel it in your bones, see it in their eyes. There shall be no doubt, no room for hesitation. You must act without question, without mercy. Ethan's mind reeled. He had no choice. 
he was locked into a contract with a being of pure evil. On one hand, the power within him was seductive and intoxicating, but it came with a price, a price he wasn't sure he was willing to pay. Dr. Hargrove stepped back, his presence receding slightly, though the chill in the air remained. I will return when it is time for your first task, he said. With those final words, Hargrove disappeared into the shadows, the darkness swallowing him whole. The cell door, which had been closed tightly just moments ago, creaked open of its own accord, the way clear for Ethan to leave. He stood there for a moment, his heart pounding. He was free, free from the cell, free from the mundane limitations of his old life. But the cost of that freedom was unimaginable, horrific beyond measure. What had he done? Ethan stepped out of the cell, his movements smooth and controlled, the power within him responding to his every beck and call. He made his way through the dimly lit corridors of the jail, moving with an unexpected, exhilarating confidence. As he passed by the guards, he noticed something strange. They didn't react to him at all. It was as if he were invisible, a ghost passing through their midst. He glanced up at the security cameras mounted on the walls, but his image would never again be captured. To the outside world, his visage would be forever immemorable, blurred beyond recognition, his passage nothing more than a meaningless flicker of shadows. Ethan made his way to the exit, the heavy doors swinging open as he approached. The wintry air hit him like a shock, the reality of his new life settling in. He was no longer just Ethan Hall, the nurse who had made a terrible mistake. He was something else now, something powerful and dangerous, and there was no turning back. Chapter 5 The cold night air hit Ethan as he stepped out of the jail and into the deserted streets. The city of Minneapolis stretched out before him, a labyrinth of concrete and glass, its lights flickering like distant stars. He stood at the threshold for a moment, taking it all in, the weight of his newfound power settling heavily on his shoulders. His body, once worn down by years of stress and injury, now pulsed with an unnatural energy. His senses were sharper, his movements more fluid and his mind hummed with a strange new awareness. Yet, beneath the surface, there was an undercurrent of dread. Ethan began walking, his footsteps echoing in the empty streets. He didn't know where he was going. He only knew that he needed to keep moving. His mind raced with the implications of the deal he had made with Dr. Hargrove. The power was intoxicating, yes, but the cost... The cost was something he wasn't sure he could bear. He knew he had to fulfill the tasks given to him by Dr. Hargrove, but the thought of taking more lives, of becoming a demon-serving puppet, filled him with a deep sense of revulsion. As he walked, his thoughts inevitably turned to Emily and Sherman. He hadn't seen them since his arrest, and the guilt of abandoning them gnawed at his conscience. Emily had always been the light in his life, even as their relationship had deteriorated under the weight of their respective struggles. She had her issues, yes, but he had loved her through it all. And Sherman, their loyal golden retriever, Ethan couldn't bear the thought of never seeing him again, of leaving the dog to wonder why his master had disappeared. Emily knew about his arrest. Of course she did. There was no way she couldn't. Despite her constant inebriation, she had called him frantically after the incident at the hospital, leaving voicemails that grew increasingly panicked when he didn't respond. Ethan could still hear her voice in his head, slurred and desperate, as she begged him to tell her what was going on. She had learned the basics from the police who had come to the apartment, looking for anything that might explain why Ethan had snapped. They had told her about the surgery, how he had been attacked by a patient who had smuggled in a weapon, and how Ethan had retaliated in a moment of uncontrollable rage, killing the man. They had explained that it wasn't just the act itself, 
but the sheer brutality of it, the disproportionate response that had led to his arrest and charges. But Emily, in her fog of wine and despair, hadn't fully grasped the gravity of it. To her, it was all a terrible mistake, something that could be fixed, something that would go away if they just tried hard enough. She had clung to the hope that Ethan would come home, that they could somehow move past this. And now, as Ethan walked through the quiet streets, that hope was a knife in his heart. He had changed. There was no going back to the life they had before. But he couldn't stop himself from wanting to see her, to see Sherman, one last time, even if it was only to say goodbye. As he approached the building, the familiar sight of their small apartment brought a lump to his throat. He paused outside the door, his hand hovering over the doorknob. For a moment, he considered turning back, walking away before he could make things worse. But then he heard a sound, a soft whine from inside. Sherman. The dog's mournful cry broke through Ethan's hesitation. He turned the knob and stepped inside, the door creaking softly as it opened. The apartment was dark, save for the faint glow of a lamp in the living room. Ethan could see Emily's outline on the couch and a bottle of wine on the table in front of her. Sherman lay curled at her feet, his ears perking up as Ethan entered. Ethan? Emily's voice was thick with sleep and alcohol as she sat up, blinking in the dim light. Is that you? Ethan hesitated in the doorway, unsure of how to explain himself. He had no idea how much she knew about what had happened since his arrest, but as he stepped further into the room, the look on Emily's face shifted from confusion to relief. Ethan! Oh my god, it's you! It's really you! She sputtered, trying desperately to hold back tears. What are you doing here? I... I they told me you were... that you couldn't... Her words trailed off as she stumbled to her feet, wrapping her arms around him. Ethan stiffened at the contact, the warmth of her embrace both comforting and painful. He could feel the power inside him, pulsing beneath his skin, a constant reminder of what he had become. But for a moment, he allowed himself to hold her, to feel something other than the all-consuming dread that had overwhelmed him since his first encounter with Dr. Hargrove. I'm here, he said, his voice thick with emotion. I'm okay. I'm okay. Emily pulled back slightly, her eyes searching his face. What happened? How did you get here? I... I don't know what to think. Ethan struggled for an explanation that wouldn't terrify her, that wouldn't reveal the darkness that accented his every thought. It's... complicated, he finally said. I've been dealing with some... some things, but I'm here now. Sherman, sensing his master's distress, nudged Ethan's leg with his nose, his tail wagging weakly. Ethan knelt down, rubbing the dog's head, feeling a pang of guilt as he looked into those trusting eyes. Sherman didn't understand what had happened, but he could sense the change in Ethan, and that made the guilt even harder to bear. As Ethan knelt there, something struck him. Despite everything that had changed about him, Emily and Sherman could see him perfectly fine. No blurring of his features, no distortion, just the familiar Ethan they had always known. He had noticed this earlier, but now the realization hit him with full force. Somehow, he had control over who could see him clearly and who couldn't. It was as if his subconscious decided who was allowed to see him as he truly was and who wasn't. He had seen it before when passing by people on the street, their confused expressions as they tried to make out his face, only to find it slipping away from their perception like smoke. But here, in the apartment, Emily looked at him as if nothing had changed, and Sherman nuzzled him as if he were the same Ethan who had left the apartment that fateful day. Ethan didn't understand the mechanism or process behind this control. It was as if his mind had created a barrier, a shield that protected him from those who might be a threat. But for Emily and Sherman, there was no need for such defenses. They weren't a threat. 
They were the two beings he wanted more than anything to see him, to know him, to anchor him to the remnants of his humanity. The realization left him both relieved and unsettled. He had this power, this ability to manipulate how others perceived him, but he didn't fully comprehend it. It was terrifying to think about the implications, about what it meant for him and for those around him. The one person, or rather entity, he had no control over was Dr. Hargrove. Ethan knew, deep in his soul, that he could never hide from the plague doctor. Not for long, anyway. The thought sent a shiver down his spine, a reminder of the chains he had willingly placed around himself. I missed you, buddy, Ethan whispered to Sherman, his voice breaking. I'm so sorry. Emily sat back down on the couch, her hands trembling as she reached for the wine bottle. She poured herself another glass, but her eyes never left Ethan. What's going on, Ethan? You're scaring me. Ethan sat down beside her, his hands wrung together tightly to stop them from shaking. Emily, there's something I need to tell you. Something I don't even really understand it myself. He took a deep breath, trying to steady himself. I made a mistake. A big one. And now, now I have to deal with the consequences. Emily's eyes widened, her grip tightening on the wine glass. What do you mean? What kind of mistake? Are you talking about the man, the, the patient you hurt? Whatever it is, you can tell me. Ethan hesitated, his mind racing with a thousand possible explanations. He wanted to protect her, to shield her from the truth, but he knew he couldn't keep it all from her. She deserved to know, at least some of it. There's this... man, Ethan began, struggling to find the right words, hesitant to describe Hargrove as human. He offered me a way out, a way to fix everything. But it's... it's, it's not what I thought it would be, Em, and I don't know how to get out of it. Emily's face paled, her eyes searching his for answers. What are you talking about? Who is this man? Ethan shook his head, frustration and fear bubbling to the surface. It's not that simple, Emily. He's not... he's not just a man. He's something else, something powerful. And now I'm stuck in this... this nightmare and I don't know how to wake up. Emily stared at him, her eyes wide with shock and fear, the effects of the alcohol further heightening her sensitivities. Ethan... What did you do? Ethan opened his mouth to answer, but before he could speak, a cold voice cut through the air, freezing him in place. You should be more careful with your words, Mr. Hall. Ethan's blood ran cold as he turned to see Dr. Atticus Hargrove standing in the doorway, his dark figure casting a long shadow across the room. Emily let out a gasp, clutching the wine glass so tightly that it shattered in her hand, the shards falling to the floor. Who... who is that? Emily whispered, her voice trembling. Ethan's heart pounded in his chest, fear gripping him like a vice. Emily, stay back, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Just stay back. Hargrove stepped into the room, his presence overwhelming, the air growing colder with each step he took. I warned you, Mr. Hall, there are consequences for disobedience. Ethan felt his knees weaken, the power within him surging as if responding to the threat, but he forced himself to stay calm, to keep control. Leave her out of this, he said his voice steady despite the fear clawing at his insides. This is between you and me. Dr. Hargrove tilted his head slightly, the mask obscuring his expression, but Ethan could sense the amusement in his voice. Is that so? You seem to have forgotten the terms of our agreement, Mr. Hall. You belong to me now, and I will not tolerate insubordination. Ethan's mind raced, desperation clawing at him. He couldn't let this happen. 
He couldn't let Emily get hurt because of him. Please. She doesn't know anything. She's not involved. Just... just let her go. Dr. Hargrove seemed to consider this for a moment, the silence stretching out painfully. Then, with a detached finality, he spoke. Very well. I shall spare her, for now. But you will learn, Mr. Hall, that there are prices to be paid for defiance. Before Ethan could react, Dr. Hargrove raised a gloved hand, and a wave of darkness swept through the room. Emily's eyes rolled back, her body going limp as she collapsed onto the couch, unconscious. Sherman let out a low growl, but even he seemed powerless against the force emanating from the plague doctor. Ethan rushed to Emily's side, his heart hammering in his chest. He checked her pulse, relief flooding through him when he felt the steady beat beneath his fingers. She was alive, but whatever Dr. Hargrove had done to her, it had left her in a deep, unnatural sleep. What did you do to her? Ethan demanded, his voice shaking with a mixture of anger and fear. Hargrove lowered his hand, the dark energy dissipating. She will wake in time, he said calmly. But you, Mr. Hull, must now make a choice. You can continue to resist me, and your loved ones will suffer the consequences. Or you can accept your place and carry out the tasks I have set before you. The choice is yours. Ethan's fists clenched at his sides, his mind screaming at the unfairness of it all. But he knew he had no real choice. He had bound himself to Dr. Hargrove, and now the people he cared about were at risk because of him. Fine, Ethan said through gritted teeth. I'll do what you want. Just don't hurt her. Don't hurt them. Ethan cast a furtive glance in Sherman's direction. Dr. Hargrove inclined his head slightly, as if acknowledging a decision already made. Good, then we understand one another. I will return when it is time for your first task. Be ready. With that, the plague doctor turned and walked out of the apartment, his figure disappearing into the shadows as if he had never been there at all. The door closed silently behind him, leaving Ethan standing in the middle of the room, his heart heavy with despair. He looked down at Emily, her face peaceful in sleep, and then at Sherman, who had curled up beside her. Ethan knelt beside them, his head in his hands, and wept. He was free from the cell and the confines of his old life, but he was far from liberated. His deal with Hargrove bound him tighter than any prison bars ever could. And now, with the lives of those he cared about hanging in the balance, he knew he could never escape. Ethan sat there in the silence of the apartment, considering the cost of Hargrove's so-called freedom. His humanity, his very soul, the fate of his loved ones... Everything was now in the hands of a dark force that demanded obedience and offered only pain in return. And as the minutes turned into hours, Ethan remained there, watching over Emily and Sherman, knowing that when the time came, he would have to rise and face the darkness he had invited into his life. There was no other choice. Not anymore. Chapter 6 The hours bled together as Ethan sat in the dimly lit apartment. Emily lay on the couch, still unconscious, her breathing steady but unnaturally slow. Sherman had curled up at her feet, his eyes watchful, his instincts telling him that something was terribly wrong. Ethan's mind was a whirlwind of emotions, fear, guilt, anger, all swirling together in a chaotic storm that left him feeling helpless. Dr. Hargrove had made it clear that there was no escape, no way out of the dark bargain Ethan had struck. And now, the lives of the people he cared about most were in the balance. He stood up, slowly, careful not to disturb Emily or Sherman. The room felt suffocating, the walls closing in as his thoughts spiraled. He knew that Dr. Hargrove would return soon, 
and that when he did, Ethan would have to carry out whatever twisted assignment the plague doctor had in mind. The thought sent a shiver down his spine, but he knew there was no other option. Not if he wanted to protect Emily and Sherman. Ethan walked to the window, staring out at the city below. The lights of Minneapolis twinkled in the distance, the world outside continuing on as if nothing had changed. But for Ethan, everything had. He was no longer just a man. He was something else now, something dangerous. And the power that surged within him was both a blessing and a curse. As he stood there, lost in thought, he heard a soft sound behind him. He turned to see Emily stirring on the couch, her eyelids fluttering as she slowly regained consciousness. Relief flooded through him, but it was quickly tempered by the knowledge of what was to come. Emily? Ethan said softly, moving to her side. Em, are you okay? She opened her eyes, blinking in the dim light. For a moment, she seemed disoriented, her gaze unfocused. But then, her eyes found Ethan's, and a flicker of recognition crossed her face. Ethan? What happened? I... I feel so... strange. She murmured, her voice weak. Ethan knelt beside her, taking her hand in his. It's okay, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. You're safe now. Just rest. Emily's brow furrowed, her eyes searching his face. I remember... There... Was there someone here? That man... Who was he? Ethan's heart skipped a beat. He had hoped she wouldn't remember Hargrove, but it seemed that whatever the plague doctor had done to her, it hadn't erased the memory entirely. It doesn't matter now, Em, Ethan said quickly. He's gone. Just focus on getting better. Emily nodded slowly, but there was still a shadow of fear in her eyes. Ethan, what's happening? I, I don't understand any of this. Ethan squeezed her hand, guilt gnawing at him. He wished he could tell her everything, explain the nightmare he had become entangled in. But how could he make her understand? How could he tell her that he had made a deal with a demonic entity, that he was now bound to carry out its will? The truth was too horrific, too unbelievable. Everything's going to be okay. Ethan lied, his voice barely above a whisper. I promise. But even as he said the words, he knew they were empty. There was no way to undo the deal he had made, no way to escape the dark path he was on. And soon, Dr. Hargrove would return, demanding Ethan fulfill his end of the bargain. Ethan helped Emily sit up, guiding her to the kitchen where she could sip some water and regain her strength. Sherman followed closely, his loyal eyes never leaving his master. Ethan couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt as he watched them. His fiance and his dog, both oblivious to the danger that loomed over them because of him. They sat in silence, the weight of unspoken fears hanging in the air. Emily sipped her water, her hands still trembling slightly, while Ethan's mind raced. He knew he had to be ready, but the thought of what Hargrove might ask him to do filled him with dread. Then, as if summoned by his thoughts, the temperature of the air in the apartment plummeted. The lights flickered, and Ethan felt a familiar chill run down his back. He knew, without turning around, that Dr. Hargrove had returned. Mr. Hall, Hargrove's voice echoed through the room, cold and commanding. The time has come. Ethan stood up slowly, his heart pounding in his chest. He turned to face the doctor, who stood in the shadows by the door, looming like a specter of death. Emily gasped, clutching the edge of the counter. Ethan, no! Please don't go with him. Ethan's heart broke at the fear in her voice, but he knew he had no choice. I have to, Emily, he said softly, forcing himself to meet her eyes. I have to do this. Dr. Hargrove stepped forward, tapping his wrist impatiently as if alluding to a non-existent watch. 
Do not keep me waiting, Mr. Hall, he said, his voice dripping with menace. Ethan nodded, swallowing hard as he steeled himself. He had made his decision, and now he had to live with it. He glanced back at Emily one last time, his heart aching with regret. I'm so sorry, he whispered, before turning to follow Dr. Hargrove out of the apartment. The door closed behind them, leaving Emily and Sherman alone in the silent, darkened apartment. Ethan felt the cold air of the night wrap around him as he stepped outside, but the chill in his bones was nothing compared to the fear that gripped his heart. Hargrove led him down the street, the two of them moving through the shadows like wraiths. Ethan didn't ask where they were going or what the task would be. He knew better than to question the plague doctor. He had made his choice, and now he had to face the consequences. They walked in silence, the only sound the faint rustle of the wind through the trees. Ethan could feel the power inside him, simmering just beneath the surface, waiting to be unleashed. But he also felt the weight of the darkness that came with it, the knowledge that his newfound abilities were not his own. Finally, they reached their destination. A secluded, abandoned building on the outskirts of the city. The windows were boarded up, the walls covered in graffiti, and the air was thick with the stench of decay. Ethan felt a sense of foreboding as they approached, the hairs on the back of his neck standing on end. This is the place, Dr. Hargrove said, his voice low and ominous. Inside, you will find a man. He is marked, Mr. Hull, marked for damnation. You know what must be done. Ethan's stomach churned, bile rising in his throat. What? What did he do? Dr. Hargrove's eyes, hidden behind the mask, seemed to bore into Ethan's soul. That is not your concern. He is marked. That is all you need to know. Now, fulfill your duty. Ethan hesitated, his mind screaming in protest, but he knew there was no way out. If he refused, if he defied Dr. Hargrove, Emily and Sherman would pay the price. He couldn't let that happen. Swallowing his fear, Ethan nodded and approached the building. The door creaked open as he pushed it, the darkness inside swallowing him whole. The smell of rot and mildew assaulted his enhanced senses. As he stepped inside, Ethan's heart raced. The energy within him surged, guiding him, pulling him deeper into the building. He knew he would find the man, the one thus identified, the one Dr. Hargrove had condemned. He reached a small, dimly lit room at the end of a narrow hallway. The man was there, as promised, slumped in a corner. Ethan could see it now, the mark of damnation, a dark aura that clung to the man like a shroud. The power within Ethan urged him to act, to carry out the duty he had been assigned. The man looked up as Ethan approached, his eyes filled with terror. Who... who are you? What do you want? He stammered, his voice trembling. Ethan stopped a few feet away, his expression cold and detached. I'm here to deliver your soul, he said bluntly, his voice devoid of emotion. Because of what you've done, I've been tasked with sending you to hell. The man's eyes widened in horror, and he began to shake his head frantically. No, no, please, you've got the wrong person. I don't know what you're talking about. Please, just let me go, he begged, his voice cracking with desperation. Ethan could feel the man's fear, his panic, but it did nothing to sway him. The task was clear, and he had no choice but to fulfill it. I'm sorry. Ethan said, though his tone remained flat. Your fate is sealed and not up to me. I have a job to do. The man collapsed to his knees, tears streaming down his face. I'm sorry. I regret everything I've done. Please, please don't kill me. 
I'll make it right. I swear. Just give me a chance. Ethan's heart clenched at the man's pleas, but he knew it was too late. The dark force that now dictated his purpose flooded him with a cold determination. This man was marked, and no amount of begging or regret could change that. It's too late for that now, Ethan said, his voice icy and resolute. My employer, I'm afraid, is not the forgiving type. The man's sobs filled the small room, his body trembling as he clung to the last threads of hope. But Ethan could see the truth in the man's eyes. He knew there was no escape. The mark of damnation was clear, his efforts to avoid judgment futile. Ethan stepped closer, ready to carry out his grim task, and extended his hand. The man looked up at him one last time, his eyes brimming with a mixture of terror and despair. Please, don't do this, he whispered, his voice barely audible. Ethan hesitated for a brief moment, but then he steeled himself, pushing aside the remnants of his humanity that still clung to the edges of his consciousness. He had no choice. He was bound by the deal he had made, and now he had to see it through. I'm sorry, Ethan whispered, the words barely escaping his lips. The room seemed to darken as Ethan closed the distance between himself and the man. A chill spread through the room as the inevitable moment arrived. The man's final, desperate scream was cut short as Ethan's hand made contact. The dark power surged from Ethan's fingertips, enveloping the man in a suffocating, frigid grip. The man's body stiffened, his eyes widening in shock and agony as the life was drained from him. Within moments, the mark of damnation flared to life, consuming the man's soul. Ethan watched, numb, as the man's body crumpled to the floor, lifeless. The room was silent now, the darkness retreating as soon as the task was completed. The energy within Ethan receded as well, leaving him feeling barren, suddenly cognizant of his actions and their repercussions. He stood there for a moment, staring down at the man he had just executed. He had taken a life. No, more than that, he had delivered a soul to a realm of eternal suffering. The finality of it all was crushing, and Ethan could feel the last vestiges of his old self slipping away, replaced by the unfeeling, ruthless enforcer he was becoming. Outside, Hargrove waited. Ethan emerged from the building, his expression blank, his movements mechanical. The doctor regarded him with a calculating gaze, the faintest hint of satisfaction in his voice as he spoke. Well done, Mr. Hull, Dr. Hargrove said, his tone devoid of warmth. You have completed your first task. You are beginning to understand your role and what is required of you. Ethan didn't respond, his mind still reeling from what he had just done. In the distance, the city lights flickered. Under ordinary circumstances, Ethan would have found the beauty in them, but no longer. Tonight, he felt hollow. In spite of the incredible abilities he had been endowed with, everything had lost its luster, and there was no going back. Dr. Hargrove turned, his cloak billowing in the night air as he began to walk away. Come, Mr. Hall, he called over his shoulder. There is much more work to be done. Ethan trailed behind, his footsteps heavy, praying to a god he wasn't sure he believed in. For salvation, he was all but certain he no longer deserved. You've been listening to Ethan Hell, Part 1, by Craig Groshak. 
Craig Groshak is the creator and operator of the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, which has grown to nearly half a million subscribers, over 3,000 uploads, and more than 69 million video views in its 12 years of operation. He also oversees production of four weekly audio horror fiction podcasts, faithfully adapting and featuring the work of thousands of indie horror authors. A published author himself, Dozens of his short stories have been adapted for this channel and other platforms. He holds a bachelor's degree in communication from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. In his free time, Groshek enjoys a wide range of outdoor activities, traveling, and spending time with three horror-loving children and his friends. Well, listeners, it looks like we'll have to wait until next week to see how Ethan's story turns out. And, if I'm not mistaken, our next episode airs on Halloween night, doesn't it? Rather fitting, if I do say so myself. Thank you all for joining me tonight, and I hope that you can find time in your festivities next week to tune in then. Until that time, folks, enjoy the Halloween season, and of course, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you are after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.